and welcome back to the c Center Journey with me, Ryan. In this next section, we're going to look at the error disabled recovery and a recap of what we've discussed so far through the LAN section. For those who don't know, you can contact me here on YouTube, on LinkedIn, or Twitter. So let's get started with error recovery. Why do we have it? Now, in the previous video, we talked about port security, and we said port security was a method of controlling who, what, and how many devices connect to our switches. And it does that by learning MAC addresses on the ports and then allowing us to set up static or sticky or dynamic addresses to actually be learned on those ports or how many devices. So if someone plugged this hub or switch into a single port and multiple devices were learned on that port, we can shut it down. But we also went through the description of an error disabled state. When the port violation occurred, in this case, using the shutdown, which is the default method for port security, the port would go into an error disabled state and it will manually require an engineer to go to that port and do the shut, no shut to bring it back up. Whereas you can imagine if you've got a large switching campus with thousands and thousands of devices connecting to each and every port, you need to be more aware of the balance between security and flexibility and some of that involves actually having some automatic error disable recovery in place to help you as an administrator control the switching domain. Now error disable recovery allows us to do a few things to help the administrators. Ultimately what error disable recovery does is exactly what it says it helps recover the error disable state. So it can be configured for one or multiple types of violation. Even though the error disable state up till now has been primarily focused on port security, there are other features like UDLD and spanning tree, which makes use of the error disable state and in turn the error disable recovery feature. And the timers can be figured against the error disable reason because not every reason we want to automatically actually recover from an error. If there was an error, let's say on spanning tree, maybe that's going to be more severe because it actually affects the data plane and the actual traffic forwarding. So because of that, we may not want that to auto recover because it could recover and cause loops in our network. But an end user plugging in a device and violating port security, that may not be much of an issue for us and therefore we may want to auto recover that port. So how do we actually configure the error disable feature? Well, pretty straightforward. There's only kind of three commands that we need to be aware of, two of which is kind of where our main concern sits. But we go into the global configuration mode and we simply type the error disable and then whether we want to configure the detect or the recovery elements. If we go to detect, it will then say which detect option do you want to actually configure? So this is things like port security. Do we want our switch to actually detect against that and pull it into the error disabled state? Span entry protocol. If there's an unknown loop, maybe a BBDU is received in a particular port, do we also want that to be detected? And then other options are recovery. So if the recovery clause is port security, do we then want to set an interval for 30 seconds? So if a port is being shut down or put into the error disabled state by the shutdown violation, do we want that to come back up automatically in 30 seconds, providing that violation is no longer true? Because if you think about it, let's say we have our switch and our switch connects into, let's say, a patch panel and that patch panel has a bunch of wires that goes off to particular uh, jacks in different meeting rooms and someone comes along with an unknown device let's say they bring in their laptop from home and they decide to plug into one of these jacks and because this MAC address is not recognized port security decides to shut down the port by putting it into the error disabled state well that means that this user can no longer connect and 9 out of 10 times, an end user is going to unplug the laptop and try it somewhere else, or they're going to speak to IT. Well, if they unplug the laptop and someone else comes along with their device, which is able to actually connect to
to this port. What we don't want is for the admin to have to be called to be said, hey, this port's gone down, please can you look into it? What would be nice is if this violation stopped, so let's say the person unplugged their laptop, 30 seconds later, the port can come back up. So later in the day, when the correct laptop's plugged in, it works and it may prevent a call to the help desk. If the port were to come back up and this uh, unknown device was still plugged in, then the violation would occur again and the port would get shut down again. And in 30 seconds, it will come back up, go back down, come back up, go back down until this violation is no longer true. So it is a nice way of alleviating some of the admin work that we have to do as admins on our switches. Okay, so here we are on some physical switches and we're just gonna jump into them and have a look at what configuration options we have. So we're gonna go into config terminal, error disable, and where I really think that you should be focusing your efforts I mean, there is not much to the error disable as a feature, but primarily it's the recovery options. So how to actually recover a report from a particular state. So to do that, what we're going to do is hit the recovery. Now it's asking us, do you want to modify a cause or do you want to modify an interval? So in this case, we're actually going to do a cause, hit question mark, and these are all the causes that we can actually modify on this particular switch. And the one that we're actually interested in here is the P secure violation, which is port security. But you can see that there are a bunch of violations that we can modify, like BBDU guard. We can do things like the PAGP flap, so when we're creating our ether channels, Spanish reconfig, storm control, UDLD. So there are a lot of features. But the one that we're really um, focusing on at the moment is simply just the P secure. So we're going to hit that as an option. And that there, essentially what we've done is enabled some recovery for the port security violation. But what we haven't done yet is enabled an interval. So we go error disable, recovery. This time we're going to go interval and it's going to ask us on which interval, as in time, in seconds, do we want the violation to be lifted? Therefore, if a port was to go into the error disable state, how long until I bring it out of the error disable state? So let's say 40 seconds. Now to verify this, we're gonna go show error disable, and we're gonna hit the word recovery. And then this is the kind of main output that we need to be concerned about at our CSENT level. We can see that the port security violation is enabled, and this is the recovery of it. So it's timer, has been enabled for port security and the timer is 40 seconds. So this means that if we had the standard port security configuration, which you remember from the last video, which was one MAC address and the shutdown violation, if someone came along and plugged a hub or switch into one of our ports with the default port security and two MAC address two MAC addresses would learn on that port, the port would go into error disabled, and then after 40 seconds, it will come back up, and providing these two MACs are not learned on the port, it will stay up. If those two MACs start generating traffic again, then it will again, it will go down to the error disabled state, and the port will be violated once more. So there's not much to error disabled recovery, but it's important to know how to configure it, how to set a recovery timer, and to verify the existing configuration. Okay, so let's have a quick conversation of what we've gone through so far throughout the LAN section. So we're gonna compare this against the CSENT blueprint. So in order to get there, we're gonna to go to training and we're gonna click on CSENT. And from the CSENT, we're gonna scroll down and click on the exam code. And then from the exam code under description, we're gonna click review exam topics. So this comes up with five categories and the category that we've done so far is the LAN and networking fundamentals. I think the only section in networking fund fundamentals that my videos do not cover yet is the IPv6. IPv6 will be covered, but it's covered at the end. Okay, so, so far we've done the 
LAN fundamentals more recently and we had a discussion around the switching concepts. We said that a switch learns based on source MAC address and forwards based on the destination MAC address and the destination MAC address determines whether the frame will be flooded or switched and ultimately as that source MAC address comes in it's added to the MAC address table and this enables the switch to learn or if it already knows about a particular MAC address it uses this opportunity to actually refresh the timer. We went into duplexing and speed very heavily. We have a video that looks at how duplexing and speed works together and how auto negotiation ensures that the ports are correctly connected or what problems it can cause. We then looked at VLANs, the different reasons why we need VLANs and what networking was like prior to VLANs, along with an understanding of access ports versus trunk ports where they live in the network and how you go ahead and configure them. Along with Dot1Q, we had a look at the Ethernet frame and had a look at where Dot1Q actually sits inside that frame. We looked at the Layer 2 protocols, which is the CDP and LLDP. We configured both of those protocols, described the differences between them, and then viewed it on the command line. More recently, we went through port security. We had the configuration set up in Packet Tracer and we configured uh, the different violations and how dynamic and static MAC addresses can be done and the maximum MAC addresses. And in the last video, which is this one, we went through the error disable recovery options, how it actually benefits us as administrators and why we need to use it inside our switching domain. Okay, so what to do next now you've watched the videos regarding LAN switching. So go to your uh, Cisco press book or to Todd's book, maybe you're using a different resource, and ensure that you can interpret the Ethernet frame format and you understand how to troubleshoot interfaces and cabling issues. So for the Ethernet format, that's something we've not talked in too much depth, but you have like a preamble, which is a, a clocking mechanism to identify where the particular frame starts. Then you have your source and destination MAC address. And then you have uh, the actual length of how long the frame is. So it's able to identify where the layer three and so forth starts. And then you've got the data that it's carrying. And then at the end you have what's called a trailer where your CRC sits, which is a error detection mechanism allows you to drop a frame if something at layer one has scrambled it. For cabling issues and troubleshoot interfaces, make sure you know kind of input and output errors on an interface and things like grunt. Maybe this is covered in the book, I'm not too sure. If it is, have a look into that in a bit of depth and just make sure you're happy with this. But ultimately, these are the two bits that I would say looking at this particular section of the blueprint that I would say the uh, videos that I've produced do not go into too much detail around. So like I said, it's important that you use multiple sources to achieve your certification. Don't just watch one video series and expect to know everything. So go watch and read the whole LAN switching fundamentals from another vendor and person to help cement the knowledge that you've gained watching these. In our next section, we're going to move on to the third, which is around routing. So this is where layer three comes into play because above was primary layer two. But we have already talked about some uh, layer three, layer two sort of protocols like ARP, the address resolution protocol, which we used to explain how the switching, learning, flooding process takes place. And we've also discussed very briefly things like how a frame is encapsulated and decapsulated on a per hop basis, things like default gateways we've previously discussed, into VLAN routing, but very, very lightly. So obviously in our next section, there'll be a bunch of videos going into some of these topics and then in turn configuring it. Okay, so what we've done in this video, uh, not much from a technical standpoint, we've kept it kind of quite light actually, but just to kind of recap, 
we had a discussion around the error disable recovery and how that can be configured, why we would configure it, and kind of leading on through our previous video around the port security feature. Make sure you know how to actually configure and verify the recovery options and time intervals. And then we had a kind of overview of what these videos have actually covered so far on both the network and fundamentals section and the LAN sections. So make sure you're going off and using other resources, not just these videos, to help cement the knowledge that you've learned. We then had a quick look at what's to come in the next couple of sections where we dive into layer free routing in more depth. I hope this video has been informative. I'd like to thank you for viewing. And if it has been, please do like and subscribe.